Hello friends, welcome. Uh, I'm Matt Reese. I'm the pastor of St. Rebels Congregational Church. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I'm just going to pray. Father, I ask you to, to help us now uh, as we uh, gather together like this online, as we uh, read the Bible. Uh, we pray that you'd open it up and you'd uh, explain it to us. And help us to worship you. Help us to see you as you are. Amen. Well, we're going to look this morning at some words of Jesus in Luke in chapter 17. One time Jesus is being uh, asked about uh, the kingdom of God, about the future, about the time uh, when everything gets uh, sorted out, when wickedness gets judged. Uh, and so we're going to read what he has to say in response to that. Luke and chapter 17, I'm going to read from verse 20. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, There he is, or Here he is. Do not go running off after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first you must suffer many things to be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot, people eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with the possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? They asked. He replied, where there's a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Well, let's pray together again. Father, we uh, thank you <clears throat> that even these awesome events, the return of Jesus, at the end of all things, the making good of all things. These things are in your hands. And if those things are in your hands, then we can trust you here and now for all the, the everyday things and even the great things that we have to deal with. Father, we pray uh, because you've commanded us to pray for our government. We pray that you give them wisdom as they lead at this time. We pray you would help them to stem the... Uh, this disease, this coronavirus that is affecting us all. We pray, Lord God, for um, relief from it. We pray for cures. We uh, pray for the right management of it. We pray for the right balance of, of, of uh, caution uh, and also of action. We pray, Lord God, that you would, uh, as our country begins to emerge from lockdown, uh, you would keep us from a, a, a terrible return to many deaths. The Lord, we want to pray for peace in our country as well. We uh, see the, the conflict that is going on uh, over so many things. We see people protesting against uh, wickedness. We see people uh, responding against that wrongly. We see violence erupting. We see right protest uh, caught up with evil actions. And but we just do not know where to begin, and so we ask that you'd overrule, and we ask that you'd maintain peace, and we ask that you would bring about justice. Lord, we pray for ourselves. Lord, you know some of our people are struggling in different ways, those feeling really isolated at the moment. Come near and comfort and strengthen and encourage them, we pray, Lord. Lord, we particularly pray for uh, Yvonne in hospital. Pray that you would uh, strengthen her, that you would... Um, uh, quickly rehabilitate and restore her. We pray, Lord God, that uh, she would be 
uh, without fear and distress. We pray for a family, Lord God, that they would have uh, a sense of comfort knowing that uh, she is in your hands. We pray for ourselves as a church as we look to begin worshipping together again in, uh, in a few weeks' time. We uh, pray, Lord, uh, that you would give us great wisdom. And we pray you be with us now, Lord, and that you'd work by your Holy Spirit to open up your word to us so that we'd see you, see Jesus, and worship you. We ask it in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, we um, are thinking then about these words of Jesus in Luke 17. There's a huge fascination with the end of the world, with apocalypse. There are an endless number of films out there about uh, ice asteroids. Uh, destroying the earth or, or ice ages overtaking us or global plagues wiping out humanity whatever it is um, down through history any number of people have predicted the end of the world they've come up with dates that have all come and gone in fact even this week the daily express covered a story about the end of the world coming on june the 21st 2020 so if you're watching this video uh, perhaps <laughs> Particularly if you're watching it to kind of catch up in a week or so's time, I can safely say it hasn't happened. This is not a new concern, this is not a new matter. And it is a question that Jesus was asked about. Uh, we are told this passage begins with the words once Jesus was asked this question. There's a kind of time marker there, there's a different event, this is a break from what he was talking about before. Uh, Luke is relating a new uh, narrative. Uh, Jesus is asked by the Pharisees about this subject. He answers them, and then you'll see he speaks to his disciples about the same theme. But it's a question about God's kingdom. God's kingdom. That is, God's saving rule. God's saving power. They're looking uh, to a future event. They, are, they have this great hope for a glorious uh, future where everything would be wonderful, everything would be made right, where the Romans who were currently oppressing them would be overthrown, when justice would be brought in. And Jesus answers the Pharisees and then he addresses his disciples. So I wanted to look at, really at uh, three uh, things. I want to break into three headings. I want to say what uh, he says to the Pharisees. I want us to see what he says to his disciples and then I want us by extension to see what he says to us. So firstly, what Jesus says to the Pharisees. He's been speaking uh, previously about the coming of the kingdom. You could find that if you turn back and look in chapter 9, verse 26, and uh, chapter 10 and verse 9, chapter 11. Uh, sorry, uh, chapter 10, verse 11, and in chapter 12, verse 40. Um, so if Jesus in the kingdom is coming, uh, they're asking, well, when? What will be the sign? How will we know? Let us in on the secret. Jesus faces a lot of questions. Christians uh, get faced with a lot of questions. And as Jesus deals with his questions, there are, we see there are good reasons and bad reasons to ask questions. There are questions that long for understanding. There are questions that reflect a heart that wants to come near to God, that really wants to encounter him and to know him. And there are also questions... And often these are the Pharisees' questions. Questions that demand that Jesus justify himself. And that God explain himself. How dare you questions? And we hear those even today addressed towards God, don't we? Now, they ask about the coming of the kingdom. We don't have their exact question recorded for us. But they ask about the coming of the kingdom. But notice what they don't ask. We don't anywhere hear them asking... How can we be ready for the kingdom? We never hear them asking, what does the saving rule of God require of me? You see, they presume that they're okay. They cannot imagine that there's anything about them that possibly needs to be changed or straightened out before God's kingdom can come. And Jesus says, really there's no point uh, saying to you, here it is, because you're not able to recognise it. There's no point you asking when it's coming, because it's Already among you, he says. It stood right in front of you. Yoo-hoo! They cannot see the wood for the trees. It is no good asking for signs of the coming of the kingdom if you don't recognise the king. 
And that is the claim that Jesus has been making. It's here. The kingdom has arrived. Because the king is here. Now, it's not obvious. It's not glorious. You would miss it if you were expecting something triumphant and majestic. You would miss it. Even if you were looking at the king. As they were. You're not going to see it. You're looking in the wrong places. You won't see the kingdom because you won't acknowledge the king. So that's what he says to the Pharisees. Then he turns and he speaks to his disciples. So what Jesus says to the disciples. To them, this is fascinating, he says almost the ex exact opposite. He said to them, it's here and you can't see it. And to his disciples he says, it's not here yet and you'll long to see it. Jesus, why are you saying these two completely contradictory things? What's going on here? Well, Jesus explains to them that uh, his kingdom will follow his death, it will follow his suffering, and also it will follow their suffering, their persecution. That's the reason why they're longing to see it, we're told. Uh, but what's going on? Why is he telling them something completely opposite? Well, this is really helpful to us. Um, Sometimes we think about God's kingdom, uh, Jesus revealing the kingdom, in terms of the now and the not yet. That God's kingdom is now. The kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom is near. But also that the kingdom is, is not yet. What's going on here? Well, we say that God's kingdom has been inaugurated, but not yet consummated. It's been... Uh, set running but the final revelation of it has not yet come that's why he can say the kingdom is among you but he can also say the kingdom is coming when it comes in its final form when it's finally unveiled and revealed it will be unmissable and when it comes It'll be unexpected. He says when it comes it'll be unmissable. To his disciples he's saying this, in your desire to see Christ in his glory, in your desire to see the kingdom unveiled, in your desire to see everything made right, don't be misled by false signs. Don't be led astray by those who are saying, here he is going to be unmissable his second coming will be glorious he describes it as being like lightning flashing across the sky mighty majestic obvious you won't miss it so if you see those blog posts or videos online that tell you that covid is a sign of jesus imminent return or they tell you that uh, the WHO is some kind of global government that's been uh, set up uh, in opposition to God. Or, or that some kind of Covid vaccine is the mark of the beast. No. You don't need to read secret signs or interpret these hidden clues in order to see the coming of Christ. To see the coming of the kingdom. It will be unmissable. It will be like lightning flashing across the sky. Those kind of ideas come from spending more time reading the news than looking to Jesus it'll be unmissable you don't need to read the signs it'll be unmissable and it'll be unexpected it'll be unexpected in the sense that nobody knows when it's going to happen back in chapter 12 Jesus said to be ready that uh, his return his judgment would come unexpectedly like a thief in the night it will be unexpected in the sense that there will be some who will be caught and prepared. It'll be, it's unexpected in the sense that we do not know when it will happen. We do know that it will happen because Jesus has said it will. But we don't know the timing of it. Again, people who think that they can read the current circumstances and, and, and be able to tell you about the imminent return of Jesus. They're spending 
Too much time looking at the news and not enough time looking at Jesus. But it will be unexpected, he says, in the sense that some will be caught unprepared and ready. What an awful position to find yourself in. That God would come in his glory. That his kingdom would be ushered in. That Jesus would be un unveiled. His reign would be seen. That everything uh, evil would be done away with. That um, justice and truth would reign forever. And you weren't ready for it. To find yourself stood in front of God and ready to meet him. You know when you oversleep and, and, and then the postman comes and they've got a parcel and you have to answer the door in your dressing gown. How awful to be unready. Well how awful to be unready to meet God. Jesus illustrates this using two examples from the book of Genesis. Sometimes people... Um, have a, a, a kind of very loose view of the historicity of the Bible. They kind of pick out bits that they like and other bits they presume are just kind of interesting stories to teach us some kind of moral. But Jesus, notice as he teaches this, is presuming he is speaking about real historical events. Otherwise they would make no sense at all. He talks about the great flood in Noah's time. And he talks about the destruction of Sodom in Lot's time. Now, Read the passage. I read it earlier. You've got it in front of you, I hope. Luke 17, reading from verse 20 onwards. What are you told about the people in the time of Noah and in the time of Lot? What were they doing? They were eating and drinking. They were marrying and being given in marriage. They were buying and selling. They were planting and they were building. That's pretty unremarkable, isn't it? Those are ordinary sounding things. No, those are good things. You do those things on times. Now, the Bible records, Genesis records, as the sin for which they came under judgment. But here Jesus is emphasising the ordinariness of life at the moment when God came in judgment. There's nothing wrong with those ordinary things of life. There's nothing wrong with eating or drinking or marrying or buying or selling or planting or building. There's nothing wrong with the ordinary things of life. We're not to become monks. We're not to kind of cut ourselves off from the world and deny ourselves those things as though some of those are wrong. No, those, those things are good things. Those things are good gifts from God. But those things, those good gifts, without reference to God the giver, without an eye to the kingdom of heaven, without a thought to the return of Jesus, those things, if they are the object of our life, are empty. It's not enough to have those things. As if we were living for them alone. To do so. To make those our goal. To live as if they were all there was. We would be putting ourselves out of step with God. What we call idolatry. Worshipping created things instead of the creator. We would be bringing ourselves under the danger of, of judgment at the return of Jesus so is what he says to his Pharise the Pharisees there's what he says to his disciples and then lastly let me just bring this home with some application what Jesus says to us you see just like the disciples we're to be prepared then we're to be ready for this glorious unveiling of the kingdom of God it is we're told going to be admissible glorious it's going to be sudden it's going to be unexpected but Jesus is going to intervene in history see the Pharisees a great expectation of the kingdom of God but they didn't recognize who the king was who Jesus was they looked forward to this final event I guess what we would call his second coming but they missed his first coming and sometimes sadly as Christians or those who are followers of Jesus we look back to his first coming rightly but we've lost sight of the promise of his second coming. We are not to live as if this world is all there is. We're not to live as if everything will just carry on forever as it is. As Christians we are to look in anticipation to the return of Jesus. And the last thing I want us to see here is a very a, a scary warning. It's to see this, that being close to being rescued 
is not the same as being rescued. Jesus sums it up in just three words. Remember Lot's wife. It's a very short sentence. It's really direct. Who's Lot's wife? Well, Lot was rescued from uh, the city of Sodom. Some angels turned up at his door, uh, banged the door, let themselves in, and rescued him and his wife and children. Lot's wife had all the privileges of being part of this family that was specially chosen by God. She had a husband we are told was a righteous man. Gonna she had angels knocking on her front door in order to rescue her. But as they escaped Sodom, she looked back, she turned longing for what uh, all that she had to, was on offer to her there. Longing for the buying and the selling and the, uh, the planting and the building, do you see? Longing that this world could satisfy her, longing that Sodom could satisfy her. When it came down to it, despite all the opportunities she had, she was so close and she perished. Proximity to the kingdom of God is not the same as being in the kingdom of God. Jesus illustrates the same thing then with another couple of pictures. There's a couple sleeping in bed. One is safe and one is lost. There's two women that are at work during the daytime. They're preparing food. One is safe and one is lost. What a dreadful thing. To be separated from the ones you were closest to. What a dreadful thing to have such opportunity. And finally to perish. Dear friends, do not think that family connections, who your parents were, who your wife or your husband is, that your attendance at the chapel, goodness, if your YouTube sub subscriptions could make you somehow secure, no, the only way to be secure is to be in the kingdom. And the only way to be in the kingdom is to acknowledge the King. Turn towards Jesus, rather than demanding that he answers to you. Rather you surrender to him. Rather than being convinced you're okay as you are, turn in and ask in him to make you right. Psalm 2 is a, a, a psalm, a poem, a song written by David. And is looking forward to the coming of God's Messiah, God's chosen one. And it talks about all the, the way the nations and the kings of the world are plotting against him. And it ends by saying this. Kiss the son. Make peace with him. Turn towards him. Run to him. Plead with him. Kiss the son or he'll be angry and your way will lead to destruction. By contrast it says, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. What's the secret of the kingdom? It's all bound up with the king. Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, I thank you for uh, this question that Jesus got asked and our ability to profit from it. Lord, I pray that you would really impress on us the seriousness and the urgency of this. We thank you that one day Jesus will return. He will make everything right. It will be glorious. We won't be able to miss it. But it will be unexpected. We don't know when it will be. I pray Lord you'd make us people who are ready for it. We wouldn't miss out. We wouldn't perish. Lord I pray that in Jesus name. Amen.